Hi, and welcome to Tech Leader TV. I'm your host, John Thomas Flynn. And this month concludes another successful year of TLTV, and we continue with a stellar lineup of topics and guests. A live streaming video webcast and cable television program focusing on the public sector, information technology, and the political landscape. We come to you today courtesy of our sponsors, Veeam, Tanium, Gigaman, Advanced Onion, IP Solutions, LexisNexis, Dimension Data, and finally, Flynn Cossigan Associates, a California certified small business enterprise and trusted advisor for strategic IT business development, marketing, and solution services. And thanks for watching. The TLTV website continues to set new audience records. We're reaching thousands of state IT decision makers and vendor partners who recorded 250,000, that's right, a quarter of a million page views last month alone. We have recorded well over two and a half million views so far this year, a new record, and we hope to double it again in 2018 with your support. And we have a very special program today with our guest, Major General Matthew P. Beavers, the Assistant Adjutant General Army with the California National Guard, or known hereabouts as CalGuard. And as our longtime viewers of Tech Leader TV know, before I introduce my guest and we begin our conversation, I request your indulgence to allow me to pontificate on pressing issues of the day. It cannot be overstated just how grim things looked back in February of 2016 after a blistering legislative hearing before the Assembly Select Committee on Cybersecurity, eventually leading to significant changes in the state information security leadership. It was apparent at the time that there was not much progress since State Auditor Elaine Howes blasted the state of California over its poor cybersecurity performance in her August of 2015 audit. To address this, new security organizational alignments and protocols were adopted by the Brown administration. First, the California Department of Technology under state CISO Peter Liebert, former guest on Tech Leader TV, by the way, he would oversee the department's compliance with strict new security guidelines. Second, CalGuard, General Beaver's organization, would perform security assessments covering all 130 or so of the state departments. And third, the California Highway Patrol would lead the investigation of all security-related hacks, intrusions, and dated breaches. While well, something must be working, as it was rem and it's remarkable and very reassuring to see that in a May 2017 security scorecard published by state CISO Peter Liebert, the report declared that 97 out of 101 departments had submitted all required filings. Only a scant few were at risk and none were in the red. This is a very promising turn of events, and we at Tech Leader TV have to give credit to the reorganization enacted almost two years ago. And it is the second part of this troika, the CalGuard security assessments, that we'll be hearing more about today. Well, as usual on Tech Leader TV, we're going to continue to do our best to keep the state spotlight on its management of the annual multi-billion dollar IT investment, whatever it is, to make government more efficient and more effective and, of course, secure. And hopefully we'll have a little fun and keep your interest along the way. Our motto is simple. As I like to say, California can always do better. Let's begin the journey now with our discussion of government, politics, and, as I like to say, other unnatural acts. I'll be right back with our guest in just a moment, and we'll begin. Hi, and welcome back to Tech Leader TV. I'm John Thomas Flynn, and with our guest, our guest today is Major General Matthew P. Beavers, and he is the Assistant Adjutant General Army for the California National Guard, appointed by Governor Brown back in 2011. <coughs> Excuse me, he provides current operational oversight to the Adjutant General for Army and National Guard matters in the state of California. He was commissioned at the New Mexico Military Institute and served in operations in Bosnia-Herzegovina in support of Operation Joint Forge, deployed to Hungary with Task Force Warrior to train and equip the Free Iraqi Armed Forces in a run-up to Iraqi Operation Iraqi Freedom, 
served in Afghanistan and uh, later served as the Assistant Chief of Staff at the Guard and assigned as Director of Command, Control, Communication and Computer Systems. Well, General, welcome to Tech Leader TV. It's great to be here. And thank Thanks you for, for your me. service. Yeah, you're welcome. Appreciate it. You're worth it. Uh, it it's interesting. I, I just learned the the, uh, the general lives about three blocks. You know, what a, a, a driver and a four iron from here. It, I'd say. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Are you a golfer, by the way? I'm not. Oh well. Uh, yeah, I don't have time. So we always try to get a little golf. Uh, That's okay. You know, after tech leader, TV <laughs> respects with some of our uh, some of our more affluent uh, sponsors that have uh, country club sponsors, right. country club yeah. uh, membership. <laughs> yeah. uh, interesting background. Uh, tell us a little bit more. I've highlighted some of the. Uh, Sure. Uh, some of the things. Yeah, I, I think that maybe, I, don't, I wouldn't c characterize it interesting, but maybe some people would. But uh, I, I was not a, a full-time guardsman, kind of like the gig I have now. I, I spent an inordinate amount of my working life in Silicon Valley. Um, so I did a lot of uh, semiconductor work. Uh, I worked for Cypress Semiconductor for a number of years and did a lot of uh, corporate communications work, uh, primarily in the semiconductor sector. So we were kind of able to, to bring some of those uh, um, lessons learned and best practices. And you know, when I came to work uh, full time in the military department in 2009, I was able to kind of bring those things uh, here to Sacramento and hopefully added some value to the department. Uh, mm -hmm. But we'll see. Yeah. Well, you know, as, as we've discussed uh, off camera here, Tell us about the guard itself. It, the, the, the name is a little confusing, the state of California, but tell sure. us about that and also the different uh, areas of responsibility the guard has, because it is, it is quite a portfolio. It is, it is. So uh, interesting note, um, yesterday was the guard's uh, birthday, I think 381 years. Um, we're the longest uh, serving uh, military force in the United States many, many years before the country was actually founded. Um, the National Guard is a uh, is in every every state territory in the district, so 54 states territories in the district. Each state has a National Guard. And uh, we are fundamentally an operational force. So if you can imagine since 9-11, about 48,000 or so California National Guard soldiers have deployed to theaters of operation across the world. Um, that's our war fighting mission, our federal mission. What makes us unique is we also have a very state-centric mission. So on top of fighting and winning our nation's wars, we are also responsible for providing uh, homeland defense, homeland security efforts in the state. So if you'll notice, right now we have big fires down in Ventura. We had a huge fire up in Napa and Sonoma uh, a month or so ago. We have thousands of National Guard uh, soldiers and airmen uh, fighting those fires and working with the civilian first responders and local law enforcement agencies to uh, to get those fires out and get folks back into their homes. Mm -hmm. And um, is the, are there, there's, as I read, there are like four different divisions of the Guard, as I, as I understand So it. within the California Military Department, we have the Military Department, which is a uh, um, kind of the umbrella organization. Then below that, we have the California Army National Guard, the California Air National Guard, the California State Military Reserve, which is very much like an auxiliary, a lot of volunteers. And then we have the Community and uh, Youth Programs Task Force. Uh, it's interesting to note that, uh, that we run uh, several charter schools, we have a lot of after school programs, um, and that we're heavily invested in the education of California's youth. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I'll get back to that. Okay. I'd like to hear more. Uh, and I noticed there's the, the, the staffing thing and the size. We talked about your authorized strength. Right. Your so about 22,000 soldiers and airmen. Um, our federal budget's right around $800 million, uh, and we have a state budget of roughly $50 million. So mm -hmm. we're, we're almost a billion-dollar enterprise. And then there's a, I, I noticed there's like 800 FTEs in your organization there as well. Is. is that the, that's, that's correct. the operational side right. of your... That's, yeah, so we have about, uh, in, in our headquarters, we have about 800 or so full-time uh, soldiers, airmen, as well as civilians. We also have, across the state, about uh, 4,400 um, full-time people. So people often think about the National Guard as a wholly part-time force. So that's not the case in California primarily. Uh, we have, uh, given the state, the size of the state, the challenges that we have with wildfires, earthquakes, and all these other things, um, the legislature and the governor's office has seen fit over years to be able to maintain a rather uh, robust full-time force that enables us to rapidly respond to emergencies across the state in very, very little time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about AB 670 and the whole uh, the whole arena where your organization started to get involved in cybersecurity sure. efforts within the state. Yeah, I think it actually started well before AB 670, and, and I think uh, uh, and the governor's executive order on cybersecurity, which I believe set conditions for what you see now. Um, we've been invested in cybersecurity since 
you know, probably the last 10 or 15 years. And it's just, it's just grown and matured. And, and I think the value that the governor's uh, executive order as well as AB 670 brought was it, 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 it was a forcing function to bring state agencies together kind of in a single place to achieve a certain objective. And, and it, that forcing function, I think, is, is really what the unique value proposition of AB 670 and the governor's executive order is. Um, but we were doing cybersecurity long before that. Because it's interesting, and I think people have to remember that the National Guard is a federal mission as well. So we have a, a rather robust, federally centric, federally focused uh, cyber warfare element. Well, and it's interesting with the, your background, it's almost serendipitous that you would uh, <laughs> The, the it is. On this responsibility. Right. I always like to use that serendipitous Thank word. you. Yeah, yeah. it share. was. I don't think there was a lot of uh, forethought <laughs> in that, but it just worked out that but way. But it is. It is interesting, and it must have been, uh, uh, w when this whole area of responsibility came up with your background, it must have made, made you, uh, um, you know, feel fortunate to have yeah. the background you have Absolutely. to take on new responsibilities. Right. Absolutely. It, it's important, and you have to understand, you don't have to be an expert, but you have to understand what right looks like. And if you have a basis of you know, understanding what right looks like in that environment, you're better able to manage the situation and apply the right resources at the right time to get the effects that you're looking for. Uh -huh. Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about the, how the areas of responsibility are broken down. I mentioned it somewhat in, in the monologue. Between the California Department yeah. of Technology, the state CIO's sure. office, you have uh, the Cal, uh, the uh, um, Emergency Services, mm -hmm. Office of Emergency Services, you have CHP, and of course we have the, the Guard. Could you break those down a little bit for us? Absolutely. Areas of responsibility in terms of security, invest audits, investigations, sure. assessments, sure. and all that. So our relationship with the California Department of Technology is we have a, we work in an interagency agreement where we provide uh, vulnerability assessments and penetration testing to uh, state agencies across the entire enterprise, uh, working directly for Amy Tong and, and the folks at, at, at CDT. That's our relationship with technology department. So that's kind of a, a pre-incident or pre-boom, um, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, on the right side of an incident, say an incident has occurred, or we discover that a, that, uh, a network has been, has been compromised, that we bring in uh, the CHP, we also have, a, we're part of a task force, a federal task force, the FBI, other agencies to come in very rapidly and, uh, and take a look at what's going on in the networks and, and take decisive action to try to correct it. Uh, catch the bad guys, but also get the networks back up and running very quickly. OES, Office of Emergency Service, is kind of an umbrella organization that, that provides the leadership and oversight mm -hmm. uh, on behalf and for the governor. So we kind of all work for OES, and it, it, I wouldn't call it ad hoc, I think it's very elegant, but they're kind of our overall uh, response, they have overall responsibility for kind of um, coordinating and organizing mm -hmm. how we go about business. Mm -hmm. But we're primarily working for the Department of Technology. Okay, so you mentioned about the intrusion efforts, yep. et cetera. How about the assessments themselves? Sure. Let's talk about that for a minute. Sure. So we've done, since we started this effort uh, a couple of years ago, we've done about 106 assessments. I think we have 24 assessments scheduled for this year. So what we do is we go into a state agency, and it, it's kind of on a schedule. Every agency now has to, have to do an has to do an assessment every 24 months. We'll go into an agency, do a vulnerability assessment, while simultaneously the Department of Technology is doing a, essentially a policy assessment. Mm -hmm. So look at all the policy and the paperwork mm -hmm. and all that. We're fundamentally looking at their network. Mm -hmm. um, we use some pretty elegant tools to do that, some tools that we're able to use from the federal government to apply those resources to the state as well. So we'll go through and do a vulnerability assessment. Pretty much look at the entire network, look at their topology, mm -hmm. see what challenges they have. Any specific tools that uh, you So we use Cobalt there? Strike, Retina, other tools. Um, but I, I think those are kind of the primarily ones mm -hmm. that we use. So. We'll do these vulnerability assessments, number one, and then we'll also come back and do a penetration t uh, test, pen test, if you will. Mm -hmm. so fundamentally, ethical hacking. And uh, we'll see if we can get into their network. Um, we also do some work on countering um, phishing emails just to make sure that these state agencies and departments are, uh, are focused on ensuring that they have good network hygiene. Mm -hmm. uh, you said you've done about 106 of these now. Would, uh, how does it, how do, take us through a typical do you uh, let them know ahead of time you're coming and they know you're coming in? Do they yeah, I it's know if you, go on the, if you go on the uh, state CISO's website, there's, a, there's actually a link to, an, I, think, I believe it's the assessment criteria that mm -hmm. you actually use. Right. So they, they're, not, they're wa not walking blind into this, no, right? No, not at all. I, th I, think, I think the value that we deliver is that we come in as partners. Um, all the work that we do, the, <coughs> the, the assessments that we make, the results of those assessments are all protected, they're not attributional. Um, the state agency or department is not going to get dimed out for 
whatever challenges they may or may not have. Mm -hmm. um, state agencies don't have to worry about um, kind of third party vendors leaking their information. Um, so we come in as a, as a kind of a non-adversarial state partner, which I think really helps the state agency um, do a better job at working with us in the assessment. We try to be very, very thorough, but also very, very quick to, to minimize and, and negate um, spending a lot of time and, and, and energy doing the assessments while they should be you know, doing the people's business. Um, if we find some challenges, and, and oftentimes we do, um, we'll go back and do a penetration test and just to make sure that, it, uh, that everything is, is okay. And if it's not, we come back with, I think, very elegant um, very elegant reports, you know, post-assessment reports where uh, these agencies can take a look at exactly the challenges that they have and then they can make a, a reasoned decision on how much risk they really want to buy down. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of where we stop. We're, we're not responsible for, for telling anybody about any of the, the, uh, the challenges they may or may not have. It's really up to the leadership of the state agency, the department, to decide how much money they want to spend to buy down how much risk they think they need to. Well, there's the rub, too. I was going to mention, ask about that once you've just identified problems. But going back to this again, you mentioned uh, the, I don't want, what do you call it, the behavioral aspects of mm -hmm. it. You don't want to be go going in there and thinking that you're going to expose right. these departments right. and their shortcomings, et cetera, et cetera. And that's always been an issue. Even when I was CIO in Massachusetts before I was CIO in California, we had the same issue. Sure. And we tr what we did was we actually um, contracted with MITRE, which is mm -hmm. a big defense contractor sure. up in Massachusetts, part of MIT, spin, spin off of MIT faculty. And we had all our, all any kind of security breach, if you will, reported in directly to MITRE, right. they did, rather than to the CIO. Right. And it worked out a lot better because people were, we kept it, we kept it, uh, we kept the facts, if you will, right. by it, but we're able to uh, use those facts to prevent it happening again sure. and happening in other departments. And it sounds like that's, you've been able to, because to, to, I was going to say it, uh, it might be an opportunity or at least a situation or environment where it could become uh, difficult if they if they th think of it as an ag antagonistic. Right, it hasn't, you know, and, and and the the incredible amount of talent that we currently have in key positions within state government that are doing this work. Amy Tong, Peter Lieber, <coughs> we are as a state extraordinarily lucky to have them in the positions that they're in. I think it's their leadership abilities, their ability to to help agencies and directors. Uh, you know, across the entire enterprise, understand the value of what they're doing, understand the challenges that they have, um, I think is, is really paved the way for a very non-adversarial relationship, very collegial atmosphere, where um, there's a lot of good feedback and, and crosstalk. I, it, it's, it's extraordinary. I, you don't even see that in the private sector, frankly. Yeah, no, it is, and uh, that's why that's why we wanted to have you on the show, because I think the more I learn about what's going on, and this whole, uh, this whole whatever you call it, a troika or, mm -hmm. or whatever, groups of departments that are working together sure. to address this problem. It's really... Yeah. Uh, it's yeah, it's really fundamentally a whole of government approach to solving a very yeah. challenging uh, issue. Yeah. I mean, think about it. You know, we're the fifth world's fifth largest economy. We're 12.7% of the nation's gross domestic product. Um, people, adversaries, strategic competitors, others want to know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's a challenge. I think folks recognize that and we're applying the absolute right resources now to, to address it. Well, th that's a good point, the resources. In fact, when I first heard about this uh, uh, organizational realignment that we've talked about mm -hmm. with the three or four different departments addressing the cybersecurity issue, the first thing I asked about, where are they getting the talent mm -hmm. to do these? Uh, I, you know, I can see, I can see you know, checking on whether reports have been filed, sure. things like that. Sure. But when it comes into the kind of assessment that you're doing, it gets very complicated and it requires a really unique skill set. It does. Which even, and in fact, I even copied at the recent NASIO conference, they did a whole afternoon on just the issue of trying mm -hmm. to attract talent for right. security job, yeah, jobs in state absolutely. government. You guys, you've got did it, done it a different way and it seems to be working. I to expand on that a little bit, please. Yeah. I, Where'd you get these guys? So a couple, a couple of things, guys and gals, absolutely. A couple, a couple of ways. Number one, we're lucky because we're the California National Guard. So we have um, the geography is working for us. You know, we have extraordinarily uh, talented folks working in the Valley, working here in Sacramento. Sacramento does not get enough uh, love, if you will, for some of the technology work that's being done here. Down in, the, in, in Southern California, we also have uh, some extraordinarily talented folks down there. Um, so we have, we have industries here. The talent pool is here. Um, number one. So 
if you want to, if you work at uh, FireEye or you know Palo Alto Networks or something, and you want to join the National Guard and 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 do that work on behalf of your country and your state, then you have that opportunity to do it. Um, we also have the, the capacity and capability to train soldiers that don't have those skill sets but have the aptitudes to do it on some of the latest and greatest training. You cannot get any place else. It is impossible. It, it is the best training available to man, bar none. Um, and then how the challenge is not so much how you um, capture them, the challenge is retaining them. Mm. And I, you know, I think the private sector has a challenge with that. State government has a huge challenge with that because you know, you're, you're looking at the, at the difference in pay it, you know, it's, it's substantial. So how do you how do you attract that the folks in state government? How we do it in the guard, a lot of times is and and I think people miss this is that at the end of the day these kids are patriots and they have an opportunity to protect and defend the networks of the state and the nation. Um, so they're called to selfless service like everybody else that wears the uniform. So I think that gives us a huge advantage. These people are simply new age patriots that want to do the people's work, and that's and that's enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you actively re attract them? Do you recruit? We schools? recruit heavily. Um, we recruit in the Bay Area. We put um, we put units in the right places in the right in the right spots across California, depending on the skill set that we require. So as you can see, we're kind of moving into the valley on some of our uh, cyber protection teams, uh, computer network defense teams. Uh, Air Force uh, Cyber Operation Squadrons. Mm -hmm. um, you can see these are aligned in areas of the state where we can draw from a talent pool. Imagine if you're a kid, you work at, at FireEye, and you, you're defending networks every day. Then in your part-time job, you can come to the Guard and attack networks. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it would be. You can't do that anyplace else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the difference. What is your commitment now? I used to remember you used to have to take a, a summer and then Every week, every other weekend, or yeah, a weekend a month. Yeah, those days are probably pretty much gone. I, yeah. We talked about it before off camera that uh, this isn't your dad's National Guard yeah. anymore. You know, it's uh, we we probably have four thousand folks deployed right now. Our Army uh, Cyber Protection Team is currently deployed, and uh, so it's 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 not it's not one week a month and one week in a month and two weeks in the year. It's a little bit more than that. Yeah. Um, but the training. The, uh, the, the pay is pretty co uh, commensurate with, uh, with what you're doing, and the ability to, to serve your country. Um, those are, people are still called to do that work, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it, it's, it's, it's a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's go back to these assessments again. That, so you've done a little over 100 of them. What are, you know, without getting into specifics, sure. and other, but what are, some of the, what are some of the common findings that you're coming across here that, uh, that, that they're prevalent throughout their sure. audience. So I don't want to talk about specific findings no. that we have. I think that would open the state up to okay. having you know, nefarious actors attempt to, mm -hmm. to, to validate what I said was a, was a, was a challenge. Well, um, without doing that, just yeah. a, a general idea of some of the more right. interesting things I think, they covered. I think that state agency leadership, department leadership, I think they are doing a very good job of, of identifying risk and buying that down through these assessments, number one. Number two, I think that uh, we need to continue to work very vigorously on employee training. And that's just not in state government, that's in every sector. Um, if we can dramatically minimize the spear phishing and, and you know, opening attachments, folks still do that today. Mm -hmm. It amazes me, but they do. Um, so if you're, if you're out there, stop, please. <laughs> um, those are the things that we find, yeah. you know, and I won't go into the specifics of the, the other challenges that we find to be inappropriate, but, but I think, I think the, the key takeaway is that agency leadership across the enterprise understands the challenges, and I think we need to continue to press very hard on training. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's like you said, there's so much of this is uh, the training can do a lot about, because a lot of the, th lot of the things are, are just not following the basic right. principles of yeah. passwords. Sure. And, uh, yeah, other just common sense security precautions that you'd think would be every day, but right. like you said, I know there was that, it wasn't that the, the phishing uh, incident a year or so ago, or one of the departments kind of on their own did sure. a phishing email. I think it was on something to do with back pay or something right. like that. And it was right, right. Uh, they got a, yeah, yeah they the got results were were illuminating, but the uh, the process was <laughs> flawed, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but yeah, they got an A for effort. They got a C for execution, I think, on that. But it, but it but it opened everybody's eyes, right? Mm -hmm. So it it at the end of the day added some value. Probably not yeah. the way you'd want to do it, but uh, mm -hmm. and I think they were they were they were talked to about that. I'm not yeah. sure how all that turned <laughs> out, but don't want to know. Um, but I think it it opened everybody's eyes, right? Yeah. Um, 
One of the one of the things you you mentioned, any kind of IT when it comes to IT, has been my mantra that, that it all boils down to executive sponsorship, sure. and the being able to get not just the propeller heads, the IT sure. folks, the security folks, but get the the key folks in the department to realize that this is something. These are career is over kind of things. Pretty much. If you have a breach in one of your data systems, sure. and you have to be aware of it and should be. Yeah. Uh, uh, I like to say on this program, we I read not too long ago about, they're talking about uh, if you're on a board of directors of a company mm -hmm. and you don't know your information security officer by his first name yeah. or her first name, you got a big problem and sure. you could have fiduciary responsibility if something goes wrong. You really have to get involved in these yep. issues. And that's, how are you going about getting the executives, if you will, how do you, how do you approach them and, and make them aware of how big this problem is? So I think it's important to note that that Governor Brown is 110 percent behind this. His executive order, I think, called it out in very plain language that this is important to to the administration and, apart, and important to state government. Um, when we visit uh, agencies through our, our vulnerability assessments and pen testing, I, we see nothing but support. Um, we see that they understand the challenge. When I'm at an undersecretary's meeting in the cabinet, um, we see the importance is discussed, it's talked about, um, people are motivated, they're being motivated to, uh, to ensure that, uh, that we reduce vulnerabilities across the entire state enterprise. My boss, the adjutant general, he's sitting in the secretary's meeting, same things are occurring. So I can assure you, I mean, we're seeing this firsthand, these things are talked about, they are discussed, they are, they are measured. Um, and, uh, and I think the state's very much from the executive branch leaning forward. Um, the legislature, I think, is in lockstep with the administration on this. We got to give uh, a lot of credit to, uh, to Jackie Irwin, Mr. Chow, others that were super involved in AB 670 and, and the follow-on things that we do with the legislature. Um, I think the people can rest assured that, that the state is doing everything in its power to secure their information. Because that's, at the end of the day, what we're doing, right? Mm -hmm. The people have a right to believe that their information is private. It's not being owned. Um, and that's a tall order. Mm -hmm. So, you know, OPM. My stuff was owned in the OPM deal. Me too. And yours too. So, you know, but, but that's a goal. Yep. And, uh, and everybody in state government is working towards that goal. Yeah. And like I said, we have some extraordinarily brilliant people leading that effort. Yeah, amazing. Um, you got to expect that uh, with State Auditor Elaine Howe doing her big audit two years ago, that yep. she must be ramping up for, if she's not doing it now, right. I would expect at the beginning of the year there'll be another report on it. Do you have any interaction with them? Do you get any feeling for their in interpretation of how things are changing? Are they? You no, know, and I think, uh, I think the State Auditor has a place in this, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think their job is to ensure that we're doing our job, and that's absolutely okay. Um, so I, I welcome that. We welcome it, I think, from an enterprise level perspective. Um, and I think audits like her agency has done are important, mm -hmm. and they add value. Mm -hmm. And if we can continually improve our processes and do a better job um, by taking the advice that, that comes out of, out of her office's audits, more the better. Well, um, I was just thinking about the, uh, uh, the departments, how they react, but since you, when you finish, all right, you've got ba basically a little more than two-thirds done, three-quarters mm -hmm. done. Will you go back? I remember they used to say they paint the Eiffel Tower when they're finished. They go and they start go back and paint it. Again. We do, yeah. sure. We've done it several times. Um, so you you've done repeat. Absolutely. Oh, okay. You bet. And what's uh, the what's the uh, cause and effect for that? Just because you found enough, do you want to go back and look? Or is right, it exactly. So if we find a unique challenge or a set of unique challenges, mm -hmm. um, and the agency agrees, and they all do, uh, we'll go back and mm -hmm. after a certain period of time and, and and go back and do another assessment. Mm -hmm. I can assure you that every time we've done that they have corrected the deficiencies that we had discovered, um, which is hugely refreshing. Right. Um, the last thing you want to do is spend a lot of time, money, and energy on a, on a project like that, and then you go back and they've done absolutely nothing. So I can assure you that has not been the case, mm -hmm. uh, at least that I'm aware of. So I, I think that's, that's important. <coughs> also, it's important to note, too, that every state agency now is on a two-year time table to do an audit. So every two years, you're going to get a vulnerability assessment, a pen test, a policy um, assessment from, from CDT and us. Every, every, every two, two years. years. Every okay, two years. I was curious. Cause remember, they, I think they wanted them done, all done in three years, I think was the original. Right. Too. Yeah. That's a good idea. Um, 
And I would assume there's some kind of document. I'm sure it's not available for Freedom of Information Act or anything. There's some kind of report. Do you have to report to the legislature on this, or is that separate? No, uh, we report to the legislature, and, uh, and I think it's important to to tell the legislature what we're finding. Um, I think it's important that they are full partners and they understand exactly the state of the network. Mm -hmm. So we share that. We share what we can with the, with, with the legislature. And I think we're very forthcoming uh, about uh, the status of the state's network and, and the challenges that we're seeing and the, and the steps that we're taking to remediate those challenges. So, mm -hmm. and I have not had a single legislator um, come back to me and say that the information wasn't enough. Okay. They probably will now. <laughs> That's right. We, sh you know, we shed a bright light on the operations of the state government. As you NSA, should. Yes. Um, I was wondering, one of the things that we've, we've touched on, but when you do the assessments or when any of these organizations, your, your collegial organizations are doing these assessments and you identify issues, um, they've got to be some, some, there's got to be some pushback in terms of where are we going to get the money to do this? Sure. And that's just natural. It happens whether it's whether it's security or whether it happens on project management in any kind of right. IT project. How are you, how are not just you, but how are departments addressing that in your experience? Yeah, I touched on it briefly earlier, but you know, we'll go through and do an assessment and we'll come back with a with a series of challenges. Mm -hmm. It's fundamentally up to the state agency, the leadership of the state agency or the department to make a reasoned decision on how much risk they want to buy down. And that takes, you know, engaging the Department of Finance, the legislature to be able to articulate the challenge that they have, prioritize it in terms of reference that everybody can understand. Because you have to make you know, the money's finite and you have to make a reasoned decision on how to spend this money. So it's really incumbent on state agencies' uh, leadership to mm -hmm. be able to, to clearly articulate the challenges and the risk associated with those challenges and then being able to, uh, to, to get um, that kind of sold to DOF and, uh, and, and make the right decision. That's why we hire um, very competent people to run our agencies and departments. So yeah. it's really up to them to make that decision. Mm -hmm. We stay out of that. That's yeah. really not up to us. No, I understand. Yeah. But it is... Uh, it is a challenge when we know that, just right. fund, funding any kind of... And it kind of, it kind of goes back to what you talked about earlier, you know, about CEOs and others being fiduciary responsible for their networks being owned. Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen that level of, of, uh, of uh, oversight or leadership yet, but these are decisions that agency directors and, or department directors and agency secretaries have to make every day. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we're confident they're going to make the right decision. Right. Um, do you have, what, what if, I would assume that the assessments, since you've done so many mm -hmm. of them, that the process is ever evolving, it is. improving, self-improvement and all that. you want to talk about that? Sure, you absolutely. You started in the beginning and how you expanded it? Yeah, so when we first started this, it was very nascent. Um, we had actually started um, these vulnerability assessments with a grant from uh, then Assembly Speaker Perez. Um, so it was kind of an ad hoc pickup team and uh, we had just you know a few folks doing the work. and. We learned a whole lot of lessons very early on, and uh, we were kind of able to rapidly apply them. The challenge that we're having today is, um, and I think we've corrected most of it, is you know, you'll go through and do the vulnerability assessments, you'll do the penetration testing, so you have a pretty solid body of, of, mm -hmm. of, of literature and, and, and stuff that you provide the agency or the department after the fact. Um, in the early days, we were not very good at explaining like I talked about before, explaining the risk of each of those specific challenges. Uh, we kind of just handed off the, the, uh, the stack of paper and walked away and said, good luck. Um, so, you know, we have, the, we have a continuous feedback loop. Uh, we work with our customers every day to make sure that we're delivering value. So we listened, and now we spend a significant amount of time on the, the post-assessment, mm -hmm. um, kind of an exit brief, if you will, yeah. Yeah. You know, trying to get folks to understand exactly what the challenge is, and a recommendation uh, on a course of action to fix it. Right. We're not going to write those plans for them. That's their responsibility. Right. But we're going to help them along. Some we didn't do in the past, some that we're doing yeah, same now. Same team. Same yeah. team. Right, yeah. A little bit different. I actually was a, an auditor for the Pentagon way back when, while I was going to graduate school. And we used to do these uh, you know, weapons procurement audits and mm -hmm. things like that. And it was very interesting because at the end, we didn't have the, the exit, uh, exit conferences weren't that uh, weren't that collegial, if no. you say the least. No, they're not. But when you're working like you are, and you're as I say, you're being on the same team, it gives an opportunity to get it right you yeah. know, for all of us. Because we're all, we're all affected one way or the other. What advice would you have for departments, let's say, that have not had their assessments done yet? 
I, I think that the number one a piece of advice that I would give them is 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 do the assessment and understand that that it's non-combative, non-attribution, it's very secured uh, assessment. Nobody's going to um, judge you harshly for doing assessment. The, the important part is to actually do the assessment. Uh, uh, help me out here. So. Mm -hmm. Do, does the department, walking through an assessment, does the department actually do a, a, their own self-assessment first? They, they do. come in and look at it? They, well, yeah, they, I'm not exactly familiar with that, and maybe Amy and, and others could, could uh, better explain that. But they do, they're responsible, in my mind, to do a self-assessment. I think mm -hmm. there's, in the, in, the, in the SAMS manual, there's a requirement okay. for that. But we come in and do a, a, a vulnerability assessment. So it's not a, not a policy. It's looking at their networks. We'll come in and do that. Okay. Um, so that's kind of where it, we begin and end. Okay. Okay. I don't understand. So that's why that document that I referred to earlier is really for the department to use. Right. Absolutely. And, they, and, and I think the important part about that is that we, you know, we'll leave that document with them. We'll explain the, the challenges. We'll explain why it's important that they do the work mm -hmm. or make a decision to do the work. And then uh, going forward, it's really up to them to build in those remediation plans, action plans to correct the deficiencies. Mm -hmm. And as you said, for, for departments that are, are in the planning stages, mm -hmm. that haven't had the full assessment right. yet, Get the assessment done Absolutely. themselves, and then and there must be, is there is there a way for them to get to, to learn what's going on in terms of what other departments are? Uh, Absolutely, how, Absolutely. How that I mean, they can they can reach out to it. they can reach out to our team. They can reach out to the Department of Technology. To be proactive. That would about be it. yeah. I, I assure you, if a state agency did that, they their phone calls would be answered, mm -hmm. uh, probably to uh, some level of amazement. Um, but uh, I think it's super important. And the the earlier you get in, the earlier you understand the topology network, the challenge that your network has, the quicker you can make remediation and the more secure your network's going to mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's highly technical, but at the end of the day, it's not rocket science, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we, need to, uh, we need to do these things, and it's important. And I think every state agency is, is ultimately going to, and department is going to be uh, assessed. And uh, the quicker we can get to that work and, and understand what's going on, the better off we'll all be. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the role that the California Highway Patrol yep. Uh, do do they act? Where, at, what, at what point from the assessments would would something be be uh, given over for the for sure. the highway patrol? Is that you or is that the couple of ways? Or? Couple of ways that would happen. So they could just their IT department could see some unusual activity and it could be templated as a as a uh, as a as a threat. They the agency would then call CHP. Um, that's one way to do it. They call, they'd also call the Department of Technology, and mm -hmm. there's a very elegant method of doing all that. And then uh, sometimes when we're doing a vulnerability assessment, there's a potential that we could discover right. something that's going on in their network, mm -hmm. and that would trigger a call to, uh, to CHP, to the Department of Technology, and we can also, like I said before, bring in the FBI and other national assets through our task force to be able to, to bring resources to bear to determine the threat and also to remediate the challenges. Mm -hmm. And I've heard from a number of, um, of, uh, of firms out there, security firms that are actually being uh, utilized by state departments mm -hmm. and doing scans of their network sure. and amazing results that yep. come out of that yep. that were unknown to the actual department. Sure. So, the, well, these things these things are happening relatively regularly, they are. and obviously uh, it's not just the state of California; no. it's not just government. Right, uh, exactly. A huge issue and uh, a difficult one. It is. It's very difficult, but uh, but I think we're on the absolute right path um, to to better secure our state networks, and it's uh, it's it's an extraordinary pleasure to work with the folks that are kind of. You know, on the, the the OES and CNDT and CHP and ourselves, it's a great. I mean, everybody works very very closely together, which is kind of unusual. Yeah, I, I mean, we've we've actually had a show with uh, with uh, Keith Tresh not too long ago, yep. who's a new commander, sure. one of the Cal Six, uh, one of those, that's one of those yeah. acronyms on yep. the operations center. Yep. It's it's it's, uh, it's uh, you can see that the state has really taken this absolutely. Seriously. Yeah, we have soldiers and airmen that work in Keith's. Uh, uh, his, his command center there, and, and uh, we have soldiers and airmen that work uh, for Peter Liebert in the in the in CNDT's uh, facility there. So we're we're sprinkled across state government because yeah. we can you know deliver some unique value. Yeah, I mean I'm I'm surprised that well I said if I was a CIO, I mean I wouldn't fund any IT project until I was so 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 so, so confident in the the integrity of my my systems right. and networks etc. And I know you'll, you know, there's two types of people in the world where they say those that those have been hacked and no those are going to be hacked, hacked right? yeah, or those no. that have done when they were yeah, hacked, yeah, something exactly. Something like that. I mean, it's a, 
it's a it's, it's a very difficult battle to fight. Yeah, and it is where it's going to go. It's just a uh, hard to predict. You and it, it's very hard to predict. And due diligence is the is the uh, mantra of the day. I guess absolutely. You have to be very very diligent. Yeah, yeah. everybody's out there. And imagine the DoD network gets hacked every day, a hundred times a day, or a thousand times a day. It's it's oh, continually yeah. under a barrage of, of, of threats, and uh, and to think that 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 doesn't occur across our state networks is folly, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I think, like I said, I think the governor's office, the legislature, and others have kind of said, yeah, this is a problem, and we need to address it. And I think what you're seeing now is 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 that bearing fruit. Mm -hmm. And you can actually go on the uh, attorney general's website, as I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. and they, yeah, I think it's a. The law that uh, any entity that is breached has to report Absolutely. it uh, within a certain amount of time. That's come. To, of course, we have the Ubers and others right. that, that haven't done that and become under uh, intense, uh, intense. As they should, yeah, right? As they should. You actually. know, yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think that's important. It goes back to your point earlier about you know CEOs getting fired for failing to disclose these things. You know, and, and uh, I think. For leaders in state government, we absolutely owe it to the people mm -hmm. to uh, to disclose those mm -hmm. things when it happens, mm -hmm. where it's appropriate. And before we're done, is there anything I've, I've missed that we wanted to talk about? I mean, I'm very in, in interested in learning more about what you're doing. And are there any other states that are utilizing <laughs> the National Guard, like California is? Yeah, there, there 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 are there yeah. are yeah you bet um, back east primarily. Um, so Maryland, New York, mm -hmm. um, the D.C. Guards heavily invested in programs like this. Um, some serious work being done in Texas, um, both in the Army and the Air National Guard there. Uh, Rhode Island has a very robust program like this. Um, and the National Guard writ large um, is standing up additional uh, cybersecurity force structure as quickly as we can generate and, uh, and man it. Mm -hmm. um, it is... Uh, it is it's important, it's good work for us. I think it, we're in the absolute right space to do it. I think we can recruit and retain very highly qualified soldiers and airmen mm -hmm. to do this work, as I mentioned before. So I think the Guard's uniquely positioned, in my opinion, to, uh, to continue to be a full partner, not only on the federal side, um, where we're both attacking and defending, mm -hmm but on the state side where we're mm -hmm. defending uh, the state's networks. Yeah, and we actually brought up someone uh, before the show, brought us back, back to about local governments. So maybe, uh, maybe that's next year. Maybe, exactly. <laughs> well, listen, we've almost run out of time. Okay. This has been a great, uh, you know, a great show. Uh, uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, we're finishing up here, and we're always appreciative of your uh, thoughts and comments on the show. Uh, we have a great opportunity uh, at our reception later on to s discuss some of the more interesting issues with the general. And also, remember, we've got some great shows coming up next year. We've got uh, January, we're going to have Peter Kelly, finally, from the Office of uh, uh, Information Services, the guru from the Child Welfare Digital Services Project. And in February 22nd, we've got Mary Bell Batcher, Secretary of the Government uh, Operations Agency, and recent awardee of Governing Magazine's uh, State Employee of the Year. So that should be interesting. We'll uh, look forward to seeing you again. Don't forget to uh, catch us on television. We'll be on this weekend on Channel 17 or 18. So check with your uh, local listings, and we'll be, we'll be able to see you next time. And we want everyone to have a safe and happy and Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah and all the rest of that. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. That, that was, was great. Fun. Yeah, it was. It was very interesting.